Hello, everyone, and welcome to Education Edge, your one stop shop for all certification needs. Uh, today's session is about PMI, changing the PMI authorized PMP exam prep once again. Now, this has created confusion among the practitioners uh, because uh, the vacation now has been drastically or, or there is a radical change in that guide. Now, the right change from five lessons to six lessons, first of all, but also reorganizing the entire guide uh in a in a very comprehensive uh manner i call this change a radical change so at education edge we are always trying to bring the best content best knowledge basis for our practitioners so that they can succeed in the pmp exam since 2020 this is the fourth time pmi has changed the pmi authorized pmp exam prep so I decided uh, that it will be uh, very important to create a knowledge base where people could use it to ensure that they are looking at the right content, to ensure that uh, they do not have to look around, uh, and also to ensure that people succeed in getting the PMP certification. So let us start. There are these six lessons. Today's session will cover lesson number one of PMI authorized PMP exam prep version 3.0 released in 2023. I firmly believe that PMI will not be further altering PMI authorized PMP exam prep for next two to three years. So this series of videos, about six videos, should be sufficient for next two years for participants who want to seriously pursue PMP certification. Let me start with sharing the deck. Go on share. Here and share. There you go. And let's move to our slide. So I never like to call my courses as the courses, PMP courses. I don't like to call them PMP courses. I like to call them conversation on project management. And I always tell my course participants that our goal here is to create a forum where conversation and dialogue on project management can take place over debate and argument. We want to steer away from debates and arguments, right? Uh, this video is not being created to create a debate or an argument on project management. It's in conversation and the best learning happens uh, when uh, when uh, we are having conversations and, and, and dialogues, right? So uh, it's, this course is also called Mission PNP, something that we want to achieve in next two to three months. Ideally, what I feel is when you start the PMP course, you need at least two and a half to three months uh, to prepare and write the exam. So it's about a three months uh, prep course. So Education Edge in collaboration with PMI, we are presenting today lesson number one, along with the overview of entire PMI authorized PMP exam prep version 3.0. I welcome everyone uh, to our PMP prep course. And I also welcome uh, CAPM students. Uh, who uh, are part of this course, keep in mind that CAPM uh, preparation aligns with PMP preparation. However, the level of difficulty for the PMP exam has been reduced. I am also going to welcome today all those students who did their CAPM certification with Education Edge, and now they are here for the PMP certification. So welcome everyone. In our 15 years of uh, education delivery, we have always felt that education or learning is mutual. We learn and you learn, and together we will achieve the desired goals. It is our responsibility, I take it as my own responsibility, to take students from their current state to the desired future state. It's a partnership and 
hopefully we all are going to be PMP certified. So what is PMI authorized PMP exam prep? It is the version 3.0 has six lessons. Later on during, uh, during the dialogue, during the conversation, I'm going to provide you a quick overview of what these six lessons are and why they have been designed the way they have been designed. So today on agenda, we have lesson number one. Moving on, I feel that the next slide, this slide is extremely important. And this slide speaks about the fourth revolution. And usually I like to speak about a story here. And the story goes like this. Millions of years ago, millions of years ago, millions of years ago, our ancestors, they would gather food and hunt. They would gather food and hunt. This was the beginning of the first revolution. This was the first revolution. Slowly, the sense of community started. And again, millions of years ago, our ancestors now, they started agriculture and agricultural revolution started and this has been generally called, coined as the second revolution. The third revolution started when industries came, people started moving from the rural areas to the cities. And let's say about 17th, 18th century, we had this human race had this third revolution called the industrial revolution and it has it has stayed three uh, uh now for an, about 250 years we've been seeing industrial revolution and all the standards of project management and now this is very interesting all the projects of uh, all, all the standards of uh project management they have established uh the literature based on the industrial revolution and we cannot use the methods of yesterday to execute project today and and still feel that we'll be in business tomorrow in 2010 and 2012 some folks have started saying that we have entered the fourth revolution now they're saying since 2010 they're saying that we have entered the fourth revolution. And this fourth revolution is called the industry, the data or information revolution. As I said, we can't use the methods of yesterday to execute the projects today and still feel that and still believe that we'll be in business tomorrow. So data revolution. And another important uh aspect that should be discussed here is that oil is not the most precious precious commodity anymore data is we have seen these different organizations they uh they they have evolved in last 25 years and become uh, and become one of them and they have become one of the most uh precious companies one of the most uh loved companies for example apple almost a three trillion dollar company last year uh, so, so this new revolution, we need new project management standards and hence in 2020 PMI, hence in 2020 PMI drastically brought some changes to PIMBOR guide. And they steered away from PIMBOR guide. They said PIMBOR guide is a referral guide. However, the PMP exam would be written from PMI authorized PMP exam prep currently in its 
version 3.0. So if you're preparing for the PMP exam, you want to look at PMI authorized PMP exam prep version 3.0. This guideline, this knowledge base is not available uh, in bookstores, uh, in, at Amazon. You won't find this there. This is only with authorized training partners and Education Edge is one of the authorized training partners of PMI and we are partnering with PMI in providing this knowledge base. Project. Project management has become an economy now. And well, the most and the most delightful and exciting work that is happening around the world. It is outcome of project management. Recently, uh, as part of FIFA World Cup, we have seen this new stadium that was built using containers, something that can be dismantled and recreated at some other place. You can ship a stadium. What a great way uh, and great innovation. So, uh, and, 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 and it's an economy. Project management has become an economy in itself. And as, as, as mentioned here, the most important, most delightful, and most exciting work is outcome of project management activities that are being undertaken. The next slide speaks about commitment and promise. You know, whenever you start a PMP course, it requires about 2.5 to three months to get to a state where you'll be comfortable writing the PMP exam, which can be daunting, complex, but if you prepare well, PMP exam uh, is not as complex as people say, right? But as long as you stay within the scope and boundaries uh, of preparation, and as I said before, PMI authorized PMP exam prep, this is the knowledge base that practitioners need to use, consume, and, and prepare if they want to succeed in the PMP exam. So usually what we do is we create a roadmap. And as this roadmap uh, is primarily uh, created for those folks who have enrolled in our course in Jan 20, uh, Jan 14, 2023. And the goal is we will be PMP certified by April 10th to April 20th. 2023. <clears throat> so that's the roadmap. It's very important to create a roadmap. A roadmap or some sort of uh, creating a vision board, it continues to serve as a reminder to us about a task at hand. And you don't have to go out there cramming for two and a half to three months. You need to dedicate one to one and a half hours a day and you will succeed in PMP exam. Moving on. And I also say that, well, key to growth. Key to growth is to make a promise and keep it. And keep it. So if you're starting your course today, create a vision board and let's say April 15th, I will be PNP certified and put this vision board in a high traffic area in your house, in your office, so that you take a look at it and dedicate the required time towards this goal. And you will see that you will succeed, right? So, so I conduct the course. Uh, for PMP, and I also founded Education Edge, uh, and this slide speaks about all our uh, coaches who support me uh, in providing the courses for PMP and other uh, other certifications. Now. talked about the roadmap, what material should be used to prepare for 
PMP exam. What is that material that we should use? The most important knowledge base that we must use. Here we are calling it the student map manual, which we have created for our student, but it is nothing but PMI authorized PMP exam prep currently in version 3.0. That is the authoritative source of knowledge when it comes to uh, when it comes to preparing for PMP exam. Apart from that, PMI has also created a great workbook here, student workbook. And the idea of this workbook is to reinforce the knowledge, reinforce the knowledge. And this workbook has content, fill in the blanks, true and true or false uh, questions. Uh, the idea is you read a topic in PMI, authorized PMP exam prep, and then you go out there and, uh, and, and look at some of the exercises that PMI has for you as part of student workbook. Then we have something called the class presentation deck, which is same as PMI authorized PMP exam prep with six lessons. You could also look at the exam content outline, but really uh, it's just too early, not in early days, just before you're preparing for PMP exam, you should and must look at P uh, PMI exam content outline primarily, primarily, uh, uh, it, it shows the three domains and basically what will be covered for the exam. Here, PMP exam. Uh, when you get tested on the PMP exam, you get tested on three domains. People, which is about 42%. And let's say this could be 70 to 70 questions on PMP exam. Processes about 90 questions on PMP exam, and there are about 12 to 13 questions from business environment on the PMP exam. So there are these three domains. And on the right-hand side here, you see something called, when you write the PMP exam, this is the mark sheet that you get from PMI. In the bottom, talks about the student, and they were tested on these three domains, and they scored the highest level which is above target above target and above target which is about 80 to 85 percentile uh so on the pmp exam so let me just quickly put a new slide here and let's change this slide to um, let's just change the layout a little bit to full blank slide let's just see and now <coughs> Look at this right here. So you are tested on people, process, and business environment. You could either be above target, on target, below target and needs improvement. So every domain, you could either have markings as above target, you might fall in this target range, you could be below target, and you could be needs improvement. If you fall in that range, going to fail the PMP exam. So people, processes, and business environment, you are, you are when, you, when you write the exam and you submit the exam, your results would come as either above target, target, below target, or needs improvement. You need to be above, below target to pass the PMP exam. Next slide. PMP exam, it has 180 questions. 
there could be some folks who may say that there used to be 200 questions, not anymore. It's 180 questions and all 180 questions count towards your exam because you might hear from your peers who have already written the PMP exam. They might tell you there were 200 questions and 20 questions did not count towards the, your exam. Not anymore. There are 180 questions. You have 230 minutes, almost four hours to attempt these 180 questions and you are also given two 10 minutes breaks. When we wrote the PMP exam about 15 years ago, there were no breaks on the PMP exam. And the exam, I never felt that the exam was complex or difficult or complicated, but sitting there for four hours without uh, any break was I, that's what I felt was a little bit, little challenging. So what is on agenda today? Today's agenda, we have Lesson number one, business environment. There are six topics in lesson number one. From PMP exam standpoint, you could see 10 to 12 questions on the exam from here. So today's agenda, uh, as part of these seven uh, series videos, we have lesson one, business environment with six topics. So let's talk about PMI authorized PMP example. Let's just try to see what these six lessons are all about. Let's build a big picture here. Let's just go here and let's put a new slide and this whiteboard a little bit. So this knowledge base called PMI authorized PMP exam prep version 3.0. It has six lessons in it. Lesson number one, lesson number two, lesson number three, lesson number four, lesson number five, and lesson number six. There are six lessons as part of PMI authorized PMP exam prep. Each lesson has topics. For example, lesson one has six topics. Topic A to topic F. Lesson two has four topics. Topics A to topics D. Lesson three has eight topics, topic A to topic H. And then lesson four, five, six also have topics listed in it. And as in when we get to those lessons, we are going to talk about those topics. Now, lesson one that we are covering today is called business environment. So if I were you, I'll see business environment as uh, that question that is asked in the interview sometimes. And at the end of the interview, the interview is going well. Uh, the interviewer would generally ask, what are those things that you will do when you join our organization? What are those things that you will do when you, uh, when you join our project? So understand the business environment and what constitutes the business environment is part of lesson number one. So good project managers, when they, when they join an organization, when they join a project, the first and the foremost thing is, let's understand what the business environment is, which could be, what is the project management practice? It could be uh, the, the strategic alignment. It could be what benefits and value is desired. It could be how change management and culture and what is the culture, organizational culture. 
It could be the governance and it could be the compliance. And these are the six topics as part of business environment. So you understand the business environment. Now, what are we waiting for? You know the business environment. Now, lesson number two is about starting the project, sometimes also called PMI says, lesson two, start the project, same as the term initiating the project. You started the project, you gained some high level information from your stakeholders. So you identified the stakeholders during starting uh, the project. You have started forming the team. Uh, you have uh, started uh, creating shared understanding and you have started uh, understanding what approach would be the best suited approach to execute the project. So lesson two, start the project early stages. It is about those early stages. As a PM, what should we do during those early stages of the project? Sometimes also called initiating. Now, the idea here is let's gather the high level information from needs to schedule to cost and resources. Let's gather high level information about this project. Lesson three is about, PMI calls it, plan the project. Plan the project. See, you understand the business environment, you start the project, now you plan the project. Why do we plan the project? Because you wanna create a plan. PMI has put together eight topics here. Now you plan the project. The plan is signed off by stakeholders, be it uh, the plan driven or change driven approach, be it the predictive or adaptive approach, whatever approach or the hybrid approach, whatever approach is being used. You plan the project, the plan is signed off. What are we waiting for? Let's execute, but with PMI, right? So PMI would not say execute the project. PMI says, well, Instead of saying execute, they say lead the project team. Lesson four, lead the project team. It has six topics in it. When we get there, we're gonna talk in detail about those topics. Lead the project, actually, this is what is. It's same as executing, executing the project and creating the idea of executing is to create the deliverable of the project and test it. That's what happens, lead the project to execute the project. That's the whole idea. Now, lesson five is originates from this PMI's concept of monitoring and controlling. However, again, PMI changed the name here. They didn't call it monitoring and controlling. PMI just likes to use these different terminology. Sometimes it may cause confusion, but here we go, this is PMI, right? So uh, lesson five is called support. The project team's project team's performance. It could also be monitoring and controlling. It has five topics as part of this lesson. And finally, so you know the business environment lesson one, you started the project initiating, started planning the project, plan got signed off. Now you started executing, leading the project team to execute the project. Simultaneously, you were supporting the project team. It, supporting the project team is not something that happens after leading the project or with leading the project. It happens throughout the life cycle. So lesson five should be treated as something that happens throughout the journey. You support the project team throughout. However, during executing this work of monitoring and controlling or supporting the project team is extremely high. The rigor is very high. The reason supporting the project team performance, the rigor is very high during executing because most of the resources are applied during this time. Now, you have created the deliverable and you are supporting the project team. Work is done. What are we waiting for? PMI says, close the project or phase whatever you're working on or phase. And this is what 
your PMI authorized PMP exam prep version 2. Dot, uh, version 3.0 released in 2023 is all about, right? This is what it is all about. So just wanted to give you an overview. Now we will take a look at today. Our goal is to take a look at lesson one, topic A to F, the six topics called the business environment. As I said before, this topic, this topic should be, uh, should be, uh, you should think about this topic as something that you do when you join a new project. What are those, what are those best practices? What are those different ideas that you must consider to be successful on a project? This is some of the things that are also called, sometimes also called the pre-project. Pre-project work for the project start. What are those pre-project activities? Right. So that's what this lesson is all about. So we'll take a look at lesson one. Let's whiteboard lesson one a little bit. Lesson one. Business. Environment. On the PMP exam, there could be 12 to 14 questions from here. There are six topics. Topic A talks about PMI talks about the foundation and they give us some basic definition of what a project is, what are different org structures, what is a vision, program, projects, portfolios, what are different approaches to product development and some principles of project management. Topic B, PMI talks about the need for strategic alignment. It's very important for project managers to ensure that all projects are aligned to the organizational strategy or the vision of the organization. And if you start a project, it's important to understand what is the strategy, what is the vision and the mission of the organization. It's important to understand that. So good project managers, when they join a project or prior to joining a project, try to understand that strategic alignment. Good project managers, when they join a project or in the early stages, very, very early stages of the project, would also like to understand what are the project benefits and value. What project benefits and the kind of value that is expected from the project. So project benefits and value. Topic D, as part of lesson one, PMI here has put together importance. Good project managers in the early stages must try to understand what is the organizational culture and how change management takes place. Keep in mind that there is nothing permanent except change. So there's a quote which says, there is nothing permanent except change. There's nothing permanent except change. And change, uh, sometimes it is said that it's one of the most hated words, yet it is the only thing that brought progress, right? So change management is such an important component of project management. And when we get to topic D, we're gonna talk about change management and organizational culture and what constitutes culture. I personally feel that this topic is uh, a well-written topic by PMI and something that can help us even, um, uh, even have uh, better conversations with our team. So organizational culture and change management, topic D. Topic E, 
good project managers in the early stages will understand what and how project governance happens in the organization, right? Keep in mind, uh, governance happens throughout the life cycle of a project, whether you're working on predictive project or you're working on adaptive or hybrid project. It happens throughout the life cycle of a project, right? On predictive project, governance could be more formal sometimes. On adaptive project, governance could be, uh, could be sometimes informal, but it happens uh, at a different time. So we're going to talk about project governance from predictive and adaptive standpoint. Topic E. Finally, topic F. And topic F is about project compliance. Keep in mind that projects are not executed in a vacuum. They're not shielded, right? You can't just shield your project. There are internal, external factors. There are compliance-based requirement and most importantly, requirements related to law and regulatory nature. We must keep a close eye on that and based and 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 based on the nature of industry and based on uh, yeah the nature of industry we operate in, we must continue to look for compliance. Keep in mind compliance happens. Uh, compliance is something that we look for from the beginning to the end. We identify compliance requirement in the beginning and continue to verify and validate that we are, uh, we are, uh, we remain compliant throughout the life cycle. Non-compliant projects sometimes have even led to threatening the existence of an organization as a whole, right? Very important and sensitive topic. In the exam though, there could be one question from here, right? Less questions in the exam. However, from operational or journal day-to-day uh, -day aspects of in, in project management, uh, an extremely, extremely important topic. So I'm gonna take this journey from topic A, B, C, D, E, and F, and we'll talk about these six topics in detail. Here, PMI has put together their six topics, topic A to topic F as part of PMI authorized PMP exam prep version 3.0 released in 2023. Let's look at the first topic, foundation, a very, very simple and easy topic. So what is PMI? conveying to us here. They're saying, let us tell you what the definition of a project is here. The first thing. Second, going to tell us about what is a PMO. PMI, there could be questions on the exam here. We'll talk about org structures. You might going to talk about portfolio. What is a program? And of course, what is a project? Tim, I will talk about uh, another topic, which is very, you know, at a very high level, what are the different approaches to project management? predictive, sometimes also called plan-driven. Adaptive, sometimes called change-driven. And hybrid combination of both based on the nature of industry, the kind of project, level of complexity, uh, our stakeholders' needs, right? Combining both the approaches and bringing the best of both worlds. So approaches, we'll talk about that, but at a very high level, high level because approaches is a topic that will be also covered uh, as part of lesson number two, topic D. And we'll be talking about approaches in detail. Today, it will be at a very high level, 
uh, will uh, uh, and 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 will not get into detail about approaches. However, if you wanted to understand what those what are these different approaches and wanted to understand approaches in detail, you could go to Knowledge Center tab on www education edge.ca and go to the knowledge center tab and you will find a video on all about adaptive and predictive approaches keep this in mind pmi authorized pmp exam prep and the current form of pmp exam is leaning towards adaptive and having that mindset of how project management happens in predictive projects and adaptive and to some extent hybrid projects is extremely important. That foundation is required to consume this content. You need that foundation to be able to consume the content listed in the PMI authorized PMP exam prep released in 2023 version 3.0. As we said, we're going to take a look at project. What is a project? And then we'll take a look at what PMI has to say about project. So let's insert a new slide here. What is a project? Project, define a project. Project are temporary, temporary. They have a beginning and an end. Projects are unique and they deliver, this is very important from exam standpoint, they deliver stakeholders requirements. And these requirements can take form of products, services or result definition of a project right uh, i like to create mind maps because mind maps uh, they help you understand the big picture they help you understand the information a little bit better and pictures stick somehow they stick with me so project are temporary uh, in nature they have a beginning and end they're very unique and they deliver stakeholders requirements projects are undertaken to meet meet strategic objectives of the project, right? But the most important reason why projects are undertaken is stakeholders requirements. Another very important thing to remember here, and let's write it in red, people define projects as how we listed it here. The standard defines it like this, but really projects are organizational action that helps helps them get or take steps closer to the vision that's what a project is right projects are these organizational actions and another very important thing to understand here is that projects they projects bring change and as i said there is nothing permanent except change right and if you're to define change, change is act of transformation in response to a need. So what does that mean? It means that all projects are undertaken to address a need sometimes also called business need. All projects are undertaken to address a business need and business need could be either 
addressing a problem or exploiting an opportunity that exists. All projects that we are working on are addressing some need, either resolving a problem, solving a problem, or helping exploit an opportunity. Important things to remember from exam standpoint, all projects that you are undertaking must be aligned to a business need. If they're not aligned to a business need, what is happening? You're wasting organizational resources and organizational resources are uh, uh, scarce, right? Scarce, resources are scarce. And when I say, uh, so from here on, when I will use the word resource, resource, I would mean financial resources. I would mean human resources. I would mean knowledge resources. And I would mean infrastructure resources. Keep in mind, infrastructure resources. Keep in mind that all projects require financial resources, human resources, knowledge resources, and infrastructure resources at a bare minimum, right? So the term resource should not just be uh, should not just be limited to human resources. So keep let's so some of the some of the important things to remember in project management. So let's see what how PMI describes what a project is. A project creates unique product service or result by meeting incomplete definition actually by PMI by meeting stakeholders requirements. They're time limited. It could be in a better definition here. They have a beginning and an end. All projects bring change, right? They drive change, the act of transfer, transformation in response to a need, or all projects are undertaken to address a business need, right? And uh, idea is to deliver business value. And projects will succeed when there is support for the project team. Projects will su su succeed when uh, the teams have the right level of knowledge, when the team level have the right level of skills. Project will succeed when project managers and the team understand the core business need, the problem or the opportunity, when they understand it really well. Projects also succeed when you have the right kind of resources available, the financial, the human, the knowledge, and the infrastructure then the projects will succeed, right? Success of projects depends on organizational maturity too. So moving on, this was the definition of projects. And next is PMI has talked about project management lifecycle and development approaches. Now, uh, we could look at this slide, but we we'll just talk about it at a very high level. So let's to understand this slide, let's put together a new slide here. Here, so, let's, starting point, the legitimate starting point of all projects, starting point of all projects is understanding the needs of our stakeholders. That's the first thing we do, right? One of the important things that we do in the beginning, because if you do not have the requirement, you cannot even do the planning. So starting point of most of the projects uh, and, and really uh, starting point of all successful project is, let's understand what are the needs of our stakeholders first? What are their needs, right? And we document these needs in some kind of a, a requirement document. We could document these needs in a needs document. We could document these needs in a product backlog if you're working in agile projects. But we try to understand what <clears throat> the needs of stakeholders are. Now, you have listed all the needs of stakeholders. It is at this time now you try to see 
But how can we deliver these needs? How, what is the right approach to deliver these needs? Now we could use predictive approaches, sometimes called plan-driven approaches, sometimes called sometimes also called uh, traditional approaches. Sometimes you could hear the term waterfall approaches, right? So you could, on a project, you could collect, understand the needs of stakeholders, and then you could, uh, then you could uh, use predictive approach to deliver the product and predictive approaches will take all the requirements. Now hear this well, predictive approaches, plan driven approaches takes all the requirements of stakeholders. So they will understand the requirements of stakeholders, all the requirements, they will plan all the requirements of stakeholders. They will execute or develop all the requirements of stakeholders. They will test them and then they will release them entire product together, right? Uh, and creating a near complete product. On the other hand, after understanding the needs, you could use adaptive approaches, sometimes called change driven approaches. Sometimes you could use here the word, some of those agile development approaches and you could hear these terms uh, and PMI would also use them interchangeably. So you could use adaptive projects. Now in adaptive projects, you could, you will again, you understand the requirements. You could plan, develop, test, and release, but you will not do all the work will do a small piece of work as iteration one. Then you will again plan, develop, test, and release as part of iteration two, and you will develop the product in small iterations. What happens is by executing the project in small iterations or delivering the product in iteration, number one, feedback happens better product is created, value is delivered sooner. And if you got to fail, fail fast, fail early, right? Don't fail late. This, the time horizon on predictive projects is so long. Sometimes it takes three months and by the time the product gets into the market, the window of opportunity has ceased. To counter, to counter this, Adaptive projects, they help you create products and deliver value sooner by maybe creating a smaller little prototype, getting some feedback on that, and then evolving that a little bit more, evolving that a little bit more. But this feedback loop helps create a product that is aligned with customer needs. Now, let's take a look at predictive projects and the kind of roles. You have a PM here in predictive projects. You have a project manager. You could have sponsor or business lead. You will have your teams. You will have your subject matter experts. And, and the work that happens in predictive projects, it's more like a relay race approach. And, and teams work in silo. Requirement teams will capture the requirement. They will hand it over to the design team. Design team will design and they will hand it over to the development team. Development team will develop. They will hand it over to the testing team and so on. In iterative, adaptive, change-driven change -driven approaches, the work happens in iteration by creating a small version of a product, further evolving it evolving it and continue to do that till you have got to that product that can be handed over to the customer, sometimes also called minimum viable product to 
minimal business increment or minimum marketable feature. Later on during the course, we're gonna talk about all these in details. But once again, if you wanted to learn about predictive and adaptive approaches, go on www.educationedge.ca. You can go to the Knowledge Center there and take a look at a video uh, for, uh, for uh, all about predictive and adaptive approaches. Uh, and this was done in, I think, January uh, last year with, with our course participants. A great help to many people and uh, it helps you understand. And keep in mind that predictive, adaptive, and of course, combination of the two hybrid approaches, the entire PMI authorized PMP exam prep is based on is based on these three approaches. That's the foundation. That is the foundation. So right here, uh, we talked about the roles and in adaptive projects, you could have a project manager who could be a servant leader. You could call them coaches. You could call them scrum masters, depending on the nature of agile approach you're using. You will have the team. You will have the product owner. And we will be talking about this in detail as we move into the courses. For today, we want to keep it simple. We want to keep it very high level. That starting point of all the projects that we work on as PMs is to understand the needs of stakeholders. Once we know the needs at a high level, then based on the nature of the project, risk involved in the project, complexity of the project, project uh, based, on, uh, based on the maturity of the organization, we can choose what will be the right approach, predictive, adaptive, or hybrid. As we continue to move into the course, we're gonna learn about this in more detail. The next slide is a summary of what we just created here. And it talks about the plan-based predictive approaches. Change the color here to maybe red. Talks about the plan-based predictive approaches, the change-based adaptive approaches or hybrid combination of both talks about some key roles we already talked about it uh, and keep in mind the value deliver delivery is generally long term on predictive projects in iterative projects though because of customer feedback there is continuous development of value towards the final product and we'll continue to talk about plan-based and change-based approaches. But in detail, this topic will be discussed as part of lesson number two, topic D, approaches in project management or product development. Next slide talks about PMO. Again, to understand this slide, it talks about PMO from predictive standpoint right here an agile adaptive standpoint and what are some of the roles of agile uh, PMOs called value delivery office or agile center of excellences, right? Agile center of excellences. So let's understand there could be two to three questions on the exam from here. So let's build a mind map for this PMO. What is the function of a PMO office? Let's see, put a new slide here. And let's change the layout of the slide to blank. Here we go. PMO from predictive standpoint. The first function of a PMO office is to create standards of project management, is to create processes for project management, 
policies around procurement, quality, project management, uh, it could be risk, so policies. To create policies, various different policies, and most importantly, templates. One of the first functions. Second function of PMO is to ensure that project are compliant with these standards, with these processes, with these policies and the template. Third function is to allocate project managers and project management staff to projects. Third function. The fourth function of a PMO is to coach and mentor PM staff. Fifth function of a PMO is to create KPIs, a better word now, key performance indicators or Objectives and key results, OKRs. Objectives and key results. You cannot manage something that cannot be measured and PMO. They are responsible for putting together these uh, KPIs or OKRs uh, for, for measurement. You know, uh, PMO offices also compile, they compile. project artifacts and, and ensure that they are archives. Compile and projects, project art, artifacts. Com not only compile, but also archive. So the goal of having a PMO office in the organization, sometimes PMO office could be one person. Keep this in mind from exam standpoint organizations that do not have the uh, the resources to support a PMO office sometimes may ask some person who has knowledge in project management, uh, has the level of maturity in project management to act as a PMO office. And sometimes PMO office could have staff and infrastructure. Also, highly mature organizations have PMO offices with staff, PMO managers, and they look after the entire project management processes. Now, PMO offices that are only concerned with development of standard processes and templates are called supporting PMOs. A low maturity PMO, early stages of a PMO, but as PMO starts having that level of experience and maturity, they not only create the standards, processes, policies, and templates, they also, they also ensure compliance with policies and this kind of a PMO is called a controlling PMO. Now, sometimes the PMOs, they will be responsible for creating standards, processes, policies, and templates, ensuring that compliance is taking place and they will allocate PMs, coach and mentor, KPI and compile. These kind of PMOs are called directing PMOs because they are directly involved in project execution from resource standpoint allocation of resources and all that. So look, supporting PMOs, early stages of a PMO. Slowly, when they start getting more maturity, they take a shape of a controlling PMO. And finally, some organizations, the PMOs are extremely powerful directing because they are also directly involved in the day-to-day -day operations of projects. They are allocating staff to projects, right? So important to understand that from exam standpoint, you may, uh, uh, you may see some questions, but PMOs, one of the primary responsibility is to help take the organization 
to a high level of maturity in project management practice. That's what PMOs, uh, their, their, their ultimate goal is that we'll take our organization to a higher level of maturity in the project management practice. That is uh, the, the most important function of a PMO. If that function is not fulfilled, and if you if you Google this stat on PMOs, you will see that one out of three PMOs shut down within the first year of their existence. Why? Because organization is not seeing any value from the PMO, right? So, so we talked about the PMO office in detail and PMI has put together supportive, controlling and directive PMO. Take a look at it. Supportive PMOs, their job is to develop methodology standards and templates controlling PMOs, compliance, directive PMOs, coordinate communication across project and they manage the resources also. Now, now comes Agile Center of Excellence, also known as Value Delivery Office. So what is Agile Center of Excellence and what are some of the important things that we need to know? Agile Co. Center of Excellence, or sometimes called the value delivery office. Their most important function is to help develop culture and agile mindset. The goal is not, the goal is not doing agile. That's not the goal. Goal is being agile. Uh, the goal is being agile, so develop the culture. In the mindset is the primary responsibility of Agile Center of Excellence or the value uh, value delivery office, VDO. <clears throat> Apart from that, they also coach and mentor the sponsors and, and the staff coach and mentor the staff. And of course they will help, they will help with coaching, mentoring, and training on Agile principle. So right here, Agile Center of Excellence is, the idea is to build the Agile mindset. This is the most important thing. Coach the teams, mentors the sponsors. So value delivery office or Agile Center of Excellence. Keep in mind, if from exam standpoint, the idea is Agile mindset. Is about being agile over doing agile, right? Being agile over doing agile. Next slide is about organization project management from exam standpoint. There's not much value here. Uh, PMI continues to uh, continues to through the PMP course because it is the most consumed course uh, and, and uh, most recognized certification in the world in project management. So through this course, they try to also provide people insight into the other work that they're doing. One of the standards that they wrote was organizational project management standard. Uh, it is nothing but an ex uh, strategy execution framework by framework by using projects by using programs, by using portfolios and combining them to, together uh, along with operations and uh, creating a st st strategy delivery framework. From exam standpoint, really, you don't need to worry about it. Just knowing the definition would be more than enough. It's, it is a strategy execution framework and it helps coordinate portfolios, programs, projects and operations to deliver on strategy, right? So it's kind of an enabler. Enabler. Uh, 
what level of acceptance is there? I there are no organizations. Every organization has their own way of creating their own framework of strategy. Uh, and all organizations use portfolios, programs, and projects along with operations to do that. So there is nothing that new here. Uh, and people, uh, organizations have customized it to their own, uh, uh, customized it to customize this framework to their own uh, structure and organization. Slide is about what is a, what is project management, program management, and portfolio management. So let's talk about that in a new slide. Slide. Let's lay out to blank. So I can let's see. Sit here, make the screen bigger. And here we go. Uh, we already talked about what projects are. So project management is application of knowledge, skills, and, and various tools, tools and techniques. to meet stakeholders' requirements and also meet objectives, strategic objectives. That's what is project management. Now, when you start, so sometimes what happens is you hire a very senior, seasoned, project manager, and some we could start calling them program managers. What do program managers do? Program managers program management. What is a program? Program is a so management of similar and related projects, sub-projects, and sub-programs to execute them in such a manner where Resource resources can be utilized and benefits delivered. So projects, sometimes organizations, they are executing projects and they're allocating one project manager to another, uh, one, uh, one project and all that. At some point of time, Organizations, they want to optimize this and they establish a program management office and they hire some seasoned project managers or, or sometimes program managers who would help manage these similar and related projects, sub projects and sub programs and utilize the resources better and deliver the benefits. Deliver the required benefits, right? Sometimes when you start managing all these collection of uh, similar and related projects, sub projects and sub programs together, some of the benefits that they come that come by utilization of resources that will not be available if you were doing it individually. That's program. Now, combine multiple programs. You become a pro. If you start managing multiple programs, so it becomes a portfolio. Portfolio. Like, pro like programs are collection of projects, sub programs, and projects. Portfolio is collection of programs, 
sub portfolios and critical projects plus this is important operations are part of the mandate for portfolio manager so portfolio is a collection of programs sub portfolios uh, critical projects and operations now keep this in mind they could be they could be related and similar they could be related or similar and could be unrelated and dissimilar Why are portfolios undertaken? They are undertaken <coughs> to deliver, portfolios are undertaken to deliver strategic business objectives. Another very important thing that happens at the level of portfolio is investing decisions are made at this level. What project is a better choice? these investing decisions are made at this level. So this is what in the exam, you may find a question here and a question here, program management, similar and related. Idea is benefits, program management, benefits, benefits, and similar and related. Portfolio manage, management, related and similar and unrelated and dissimilar to combination of all, plus the operations. Operations are not part of projects, neither are they part of programs. That's the operations. Strategic business objectives are met and investing decisions are made here. The intent of the organization is a portfolio. Portfolio is the true intent of an organization. Keep that in mind. The portfolio is the true intent of an organization. So PMI has put together the idea of portfolio management, program management, and project management. PMI also has a standard for portfolio management. I am PFMP certified portfolio. They also have a standard for program management. This is one of the toughest certifications. I am PGMP certified. And of course, they have a standard for pro project management. They call it PIMBA and so PMP certified, right? All of us are right now together pursuing PMP certification. Next slide is an important slide from exam standpoint. It talks about organizational structures. There is functional matrix and projectized, projectized, projectized. And there is one more organization structure, organization type. It's called combination of all these, and it's called composite. So the idea of functional matrix uh, or projectized organization, what is the idea behind this? The primary idea behind these organization structure is to see the power of PM. Lowest on this side and then gets lowest on this side and then gets higher, higher and higher to when it comes to project ties, right? So functional, the power of PM is lowest. So, and matrix increases slightly projectize, they are the sole authority, right? So our project, and then there is a combination of all these different structures, organization structures, and that organization type is called composite organization. So let's create a mind map for this. In the exam, you may find a couple of questions on organization structures. So organization
structures. There are three kind, three major kinds. The fourth one is composite. First is functional. Keep in mind what PMI is testing you on is to understand where is the power, what is the power of PM in a certain organization type. Functional organization, power. It's all with all functional manager. PM have no power. When we say power, it means power of resources, right? Who, who dictates this uh, resources? Functional managers, functional managers in functional organization. PMs report to the functional manager have no power or or you can say pm project manage management there is no such recognized role this will be a better term recognized role in functional organization let's just say in a bank mortgage department you will find people they have a lot of subject matter expertise they know all about people who work in these functional department they have all the knowledge about about that department that, that organization, right? Subject matter expertise exists, but there is low project management knowledge. Now, there is this project oriented or projectized organization. Opposite of functional power, PM has all the power, 100%. Here in functional organization, functional manager has 100% power on resources, PM has 100% power. No functional manager role here, not recognized at all. Subject matter expertise, project management knowledge is very high on this type of an organization. So from exam standpoint, if the question was, well, uh, a project manager has sole authority on the project, they don't need to rely on functional managers. What kind of an organization type is that project ties? Functional managers have a lot of uh, all, all the power. There is no recognized project management role. No recognized project management role. Recognized role. PM, there is no recognized PM role in functional organization. This could be one of the questions on the exam. In between, there is matrix organization and there are three known flavors of matrix organization. One is called weak matrix and there is balance matrix and then there is strong matrix now it's very important to understand this weak balance and strong right so functional organization weak matrix is exactly same as functional organization Look, in functional organization, PM role was not recognized. In weak matrix, PM role is recognized. They may have 10% power here. 90% still is with functional manager. So weak matrix is all functional except PM role could be recognized here. And the PM role could be called coordinator on weak matrix or expediter. There is a name for the PM role here or the project manager itself, you could call them PMs. So weak matrix, the PM role, it's same as weak matrix, it's same as functional. However, the PM role now is getting a little recognition. They are called coordinators or they are called expediters. 90% of the power is still, the power is still with uh, functional managers. Balanced, there is a distribution of 50-50% power. 50% with functional manager, 
fifty percent with project manager and and look when when there are two if there are two authorities on any project or any organization, what will happen? There will be a lot of conflicts. So in the exam, there is a con question around a form of matrix organization where chances of conflicts are extremely high, balanced. Just like weak matrix is very close to functional organization, strong matrix is like project ties. The project manager has a lot of role, but functional manager may also have 10% kind of a role. Rest all is same as project ties, right? In the exam, the question could be uh, uh, an organization type that imbibes or that has behaviors of a projectized organization. However, there is some recognition for functional role, strong matrix. And then combination of all these, sometimes you could use the best of all these to get all these organization types. And that is what is called a composite organization type, called a composite organization type. So all about organization structures. I don't think we need to take a look at. We've even broken down matrix organization into three weak matrix, balanced matrix, and strong matrix. So moving on to some of the principles. Now, there is some interesting story here that we should talk about. You know, agile organizations. Let's just move this from here. And that's based. So look, agile. Uh, an agile came into being. Some folks got together in Utah, and they put together a manifesto. This manifesto had four values. Look, it's not 720 pages of pinball guide. Agile manifesto had four values. And these four values were value number one, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, value number one. Value number two was the idea should be having a working solution in place over a over comprehensive, comprehensive documentation. Third, we should focus on collaborating with our customer, customer collaboration, pay attention to collaborating with customer over contract negotiation. And number four, and the last value system of Agile Manifesto was stay nimble. And staying nimble was refined a little bit and they said, Let's have ability to responding to change over following a plan. So four values, Agile Manifesto had four values and these four values led to principle number one, principle number two, principle number three, Principle number four, principle number five, principle number six, principle number seven, principle number eight, principle number nine, principle number 10, principle number 11, and principle number 12. So Agile Manifesto has four values and the 12 principles. You don't need to memorize these 12 principles, but you need to know the four values. 
well, the top principle and the most important principle was customer satisfaction is the must. Focus on customer satisfaction. Value number one and, uh, sorry, uh, principle number one and principle of utmost importance uh, in, in agile projects. So Agile Manifesto had four values and 12 principles. Now PMI said, now PMI looked at it and this has been something that has been embraced by most of the organizations in North America and all around the world, right? Based on these four values and 12 principles, so based on these 12, four values and 12 principles, what emerged from here, folks, are the Scrum approach, the Kanban, Lean, Extreme Programming, Dynamic System Development Method, DSDM, Crystal Methods, and over 50, over 50 different approaches of product development, not only so suited for IT projects, but also suited for other industry, they emerged from this Agile Manifesto. This four values and 12 principles are the mindset. Scrum uses this mindset. Kanban uses this mindset. Lean uses this mindset. XP uses the mindset. DSDM uses the mindset. Crystal uses the mindset. And there are other 50 such methodologies and approaches that have been created who, which use that mindset. PMI said, why should we be behind? And suddenly, a couple of years ago, PMI said, well, the world is moving really fast. Why should we stay behind? Now take a look at it. Initially, PMI had put together in 1969 tools and techniques. Now agile is a value driven mindset, value driven mindset. Keep this in mind, tools and techniques. Then these tools and techniques took the shape of some kind of a standard the standard evolved from 1.0 to 7.0. Then they said the standard now, let's turn this standard into some kind of a practice. Now they have said, let's put together principles of project management and PMI also came with 12 principles and eight domains of project management. Really from exam standpoint, folks, this is not important. We are not gonna take, take a look at these 12 principles. One of the principle is that project management, project managers must serve as a steward. Steward is someone who safeguards the well-being of the stakeholders, stewardship, stewardship, right? One of the principles is stewardship. We are not gonna get into these 12 principles and eight domains. Uh, you can read them on your own on PMI website, but from PMP exam standpoint, I don't think this is important, right? It's basically looking at Agile Manifesto and saying, we were tools and techniques in 1969, then we build these standards from 1.0 to 7.0, which are not, so you don't use PMBOK guide, so PMBOK standard, you don't use PMBOK standard to write the PMP exam now. You use PMI authorized PMP exam prep. PMBOK, PMBOK standard is a mere collection of various project management processes, tools and techniques, uh, principles and domains, right? It's a collection of all that. If you wanted to look at the definition of a project, you can go look at PIMBA guide as a reference. If you wanted to look at the approach, agile approaches, mindset, uh, and wanted to learn a little bit, if you wanted to see what is the, what are the prevalent, prevalent, uh, you know, some glossaries and all that, you can go take, make a reference to PIMBA guide and you can learn it from there. So, they're now, they've turned it into some kind of principles and from principles, guys, after principles, they will be moving towards value-driven project management. They will refine it even further, right? So, but things are not as easy. You cannot just continue to bring more information and think that practitioners are going to consume it. Sometimes it becomes very challenging when changes are brought to standards uh, too often. They should be more stable. Standards should be stable, extremely stable. So, so uh, here we go. So PMI from tools and techniques to standard to practice to principles is moving towards value. That's the hope, that's the hope. They have also just like Agile Manifesto in 1990s, they have also now put together some principles and eight domains, really not important. 
and uh, we already talked about the four value systems of agile right we already talked about it and there are some pmis these are pmis project management principles these are not agile pmis project management principles they say be a caring steward uh respond to system interaction interactions navigate complexity create a collaborative project environment demonstrate leadership behaviors optimize risk responses tailor based on uh, context effectively engage with stakeholders em embrace adaptability focus on value build quality into processes and enable change to achieve the envisioned future state these are their 12 principles from pmis principles and these relate to eight domains which are probably shown in the next slide you don't need to worry about them these are just some behaviors that pmi has put together and if someone said let's define principles so what does a principle means it's very important to know that principles are principles whether they're agile principles or predictive uh, uh, agile or adaptive or predictive principles, whatever principles. Principles are fundamental truth that form basis for a system of belief. These principles could be agile based principles and the newly formed PMI principles, the 12 principles and eight domains. Agile, four values and 12 principles. Agile values and principles are extremely important Agile values, the four values are extremely important from PNP exam standpoint. So here, PMI has, PMI has listed it eight domains. And to these eight domains, those 12 principles, they relate to these eight domains. And this brings us to the end of topic A, which is foundation. So let's take a look at What are we learning here? Today, we are covering lesson number one. And we just finished topic A, foundations. Now, we'll take a look at topic B. And topic B is strategic alignment. Topic B, strategic alignment of lesson one called business environment. So let's go here. Let's strategic alignment. All projects must remain aligned with the vision or strategic plan. Good PMs, when they join the project, they try to understand what is the vision and the mission and what are the strategic objectives that need to be fulfilled. There's a couple of things that we need to understand. So good PMs, when they join a project, they would like to know what is the vision. Vision could be defined as the desired future state. What is the mission? How are we going to get there? and the strategic plan 
at strategic plan shows how we will use our resources effectively to meet the vision. Right. That's what strategy is. Strategy is what are our resources, what is available to us, what is the need, and how can we fulfill the need using the resources we have, right? So good project managers also understand what is the business need in the form of a problem or an opportunity? And this topic covers, covers this whole idea. Now, let's take a look at the vision. All organizations, they establish vision and mission. We already defined what vision and mission is, desired future state, and how are we going to get there? Based on the vision and mission, they develop the strategic plan. Strategic plan is broken down into goals and objectives. Goals are very high level outcomes, right? Broad, high level outcomes. Objectives are very specific actions. Keep this in mind. Goals are high level, broad, broad ideas, right? Outcomes. Objectives are specific actions that will be taken to meet the goals. Now, goals and objectives, goals could be broken down into objectives. Now, goals and objectives are could be delivered either by using portfolios, portfolio management, or by using programs, or by using projects, or sometimes collectively, and mostly collectively, and also managing operations along with that. So this is the flow. Vision gets broken down. Vision mission gets broken down to strategic plan. Strategic plan gets broken down to goals. Goals are very broad. They get broken down to specific actions called objectives. And goals and objectives are delivered using portfolios, programs and projects, some kind of combination, and while keeping in mind and managing the operations. And this slide here speaks about the whole, uh, it speaks about this idea from vision to mission and creating deliveries, right? And, and, and ensuring that value delivery takes place. So, Right here, good PMs, when they join an organization, they understand that organizations and projects do not exist in a vacuum, right? So organizations and the projects within organizations they're not executed or they don't exist in a vacuum. They are continuously being impacted by environmental factors. And these environmental factors could be internal and external. Good PMs are always watching for these internal and external environmental factor. Internal factors are internal to the organization, but external to the project. Good project managers understand that internal environmental factors are outside the influence of project management, but within the influence of organization. Internal factors such as culture, infrastructure, project management information systems, people, and their skills. And then there are external factors. Now these external factors 
There are various frameworks and prompts that have been created to classify these external factors. And we can maybe look at the next slide to understand these environmental factors. So on a new slide. So enterprise environmental factors could also be called an enterprise environmental factors could be internal we already talked about it and could be external and these external environmental factors could be understood could be understood using different frameworks one of the framework is called pesto the other framework that has recently emerged is called TCOP. And now, post COVID, we are in a new kind of environment. It's called the VUCA environment. Test all. Based on the nature of industry you're working in, look at these political, political conditions. Look at the environmental conditions. Look at Depending on the nature of industry or operating social conditions, look at technical. Now, technical and technology are two different things. Technology is an enabler. Technical is the know-how. Keep that in mind. Legal or regulatory and economic factors. You could use a framework called PESTO. You could also use a framework for, called TCOP, technical, or T. These are also called prompts. E. Environmental. Environmental. C. Competition. O. Organization. Could be culture, people, everything. And P. political and now comes the new environment that is emerging v for volatile this is the new nature uh, uh, this is the new environment that we are operating in u uncertainty c complex and E, A, ambiguous or unknown, ambiguous, ambiguity, ambiguous. So VUCA environment is this new environment that we are operating in. How can we operate in an environment post COVID where there is so much volatility, complexity, uncertainty, and ambiguity? What do we do? We'll have to become more adaptable. Or in other words, we got to plan. Plan with certain level of contingency. Right, you gotta consider these four elements now in our day-to-day -day planning. Even at homes, we gotta think about these aspects now. I mean, even on projects. So VUCA environment uh, is this new environment that's emerging. Uh, good organizations, mature organizations are considering and paying heed to this environment and accordingly planning their projects, programs, and portfolios. So another important concept uh, and and Something that we'll discuss now are called the OPAs, the Valuable Assets, Organizational Process Assets. Things like the historical documentation. Historical documentation could be uh, the business need document. Historical documentation could be the, uh, uh, the business cases. Historical documentation could be the project charters, the project plans, the issue log, and most importantly, the lesson learned that are available to us, using them for our benefit, right? But sometimes we are trapped by these historical evidences. And uh, I always say that these historical data must serve as guidance to us, but they should not direct our actions all the time. If we let historical evidences, documentation to direct our actions, uh, then there will be no innovation. So OPAs are valuable policies, procedures, uh, 
uh, knowledge bases that organization has, the various documentation that has been created, the libraries that are available to us, and I feel most importantly, the lesson learned because they help us put preventions in place. So OPAs, when you join a project, OPAs are available to us. Use them, consume them to your benefit. Use the lesson learned to put the right preventive, uh, preventive measures in place uh, for your project, right? So uh, all the historical documentation, they are uh, nothing but OPAs. These are valuable assets that organization has, something that the team should use for their benefit so that they can, this can help them guide their actions. Keep in mind, if you will let historical data direct your actions, there will be no innovation. Guidance, but direct your actions in such a manner that innovation uh, continues to happen. We talked about, so there's some, uh, uh, there are some, list of EPA, EEFs and OPAs and uh, economic demand, PESTO, it's an EEF. Historical Society con con uh, Conservation Building Regulations, regulations are EEFs, right? PESTO, legal. Local neighbor neighborhood demand for a better town center, social cause, EEF. Archive past large infrastructure projects, your OPAs, approved vendor or contra contractors list, OPA, tenant selection process, OPAs. There you go, right? So uh, policies, procedures are OPAs. Regulations, however, are EEFs. Documentation is OPAs. All those libraries that you've created, the vendor list that you've created, the policies that you created are all OPAs. Pestel, TCOP, and VUCA. When, uh, when any confusion, right? Any conflict in knowledge, think about TCOP, think about, uh, think about uh, uh, Pestel, and that will help you answer one or two questions that you may have from differentiating between OPAs and EE. Fs. Now we go to topic C, project benefits and value. What have we covered as yet? We are going over PMIs, authorized PMP exam prep version 3.0 released in 2023. We are in lesson number one. We covered Topic A and topic B. Topic A was some foundational knowledge that is required to consume this standard a little bit better. Topic B, we looked at how important it is to understand the strategic alignment and why our project should be always aligned with organizational strategy. Third, project benefits and value. Good PMs, when they join a project, they want to understand what benefits and value is desired and what will be the best suited approach to use to deliver these benefits and value sooner. What do you think? Should the benefits and value not deliver sooner rather than later? Should the benefit and value should not uh, be delivered to, to exploit that window of opportunity that exists in front of us. So it is very important for project managers to understand what are the project benefits and value in the early stages itself and continue to monitor it throughout the life cycle to ensure that when the project closes and ends, you have delivered the benefits for which your project is undertaken. Continue to monitor that your project is on track to deliver the project's benefits and value. But if you don't understand what the project benefits and value are, and if you do not understand them in the early phases, how would you ensure your project is on track? So a very important concept from 
PNP exam straight point. When do you understand what benefits and value will be delivered? Early stages. So in the exam, there are a couple of questions. So let's take a look at those questions first. In the exam, the questions revolve around, where are these benefits listed? These benefits are listed in, where are these benefits of a project listed there? These benefits are listed in either a business case or a benefit management plan or a benefit management plan. So benefits, good project managers, when they join the project, they should put their hands on these, uh, these documents. These documents, PMI likes to call them the business documents, call the business documents. So what are business documents? Business documents are developed by business. These are pre-project documents. These are pre-project documents and uh, business cases and benefit management plan clearly show what are the benefits and value that is desired from the project. Business cases, they are developed to justify the need, justification of need. Business cases clearly show when we say need, need is nothing but they show problem or opportunity or combination of both. Business cases show gap assessment, the gap between the current and the future state gap assessment. Business cases show alternatives, alternatives that can be used for addressing the business case, uh, addressing the business need. So alternatives to address the business need is not just one alternative. There could be one way of doing the work, second way, third way, fourth way, fifth way, and the do nothing approach. So alternatives, which are ranked plus the do nothing approach. If I don't invest in the, on this problem on, uh, on this problem or opportunity, what will happen? If nothing is going to happen, why am I investing? So uh, business cases will contain justification of business need in the form of problem and opportunity, a clear gap assessment, a picture of current state and what is the desired future state, alternatives of addressing the business needs. They should be ranked and there should also be an analysis done on do nothing approach. Business cases clearly show the high level solution scope what will be the scope of the work and they show cost versus benefit analysis, success factors. It also shows success factors. Uh, there's more actually milestones are shown in business cases. Plus, you could milestone or schedule, and you could also you would also show some high level risks. So all these aspects are covered in business case, right? Justification of business need, uh, clear definition of problem or opportunity statement, which is the business need, gap assessment, current and the future state. What are the different ways of getting to the future state? Best way, second best way, third best way, fourth best way, and the do nothing approach ranked in that order. What is the high level solution scope? Cost versus benefit analysis, success criteria or success factors, milestones or schedule and risks at a, at a bare minimum. Uh, along with that, you could also incorporate environmental factors using that pest all and what are those factors that will impact this business need. Then this other side, the business, so, so business documents are uh, business case and benefit management plan. Benefit management plan clearly show the needs and the benefits. Plus 
the timeline for these delivery of these benefits timeline and the benefit management plan also shows one very other important aspect the benefit owners plus OKRs objectives and key results so benefit management plan shows needs along with the benefits and value that will come out of it timeline of delivery benefit owner and some OKRs and that's what is listed here as part of uh, where is part of uh, PMI's business documents. So business documents are right here, business cases and benefit management plan. Business cases, clear identification of business need, schedule or budget constraints, cost and benefit analysis, but I have provided more details than PMI has it here. And you have to, you have to look into uh, those items that I've listed as part of business case, because you will find four to five questions on the PMP exam from that, uh, from that uh, whiteboarding that we did. And there is something called benefit management plan. The idea is to understand the needs and the benefits. Time frame, who is the benefit owners, OKRs or metrics, and some assumptions, constraints, and risks are also captured as part of benefit management plan. Now, we say business value. What is business value? So, let's put a new slide here. The idea of business value goes over and beyond the economic value, right? Uh, the idea of business value goes, oh, it's, it's just not limited to economic value. Other factors which are intangible are also included in business value. So what is business value? In the exam, you may find one question on this idea. What is business value? Business value is sum total of tangible or economic aspects, sum total tangible and intangible assets. So what are these tangible assets? that make the business value of a business. These tangible assets could be things like shareholder value. Can we use the better word shareholder equity? They could be things like uh, capital. They could be profits. They could be infrastructure or facility, you could also call it facility. So value of a business, for example, right now, if you take a look at Tesla, you take a look at Tesla right now, Tesla, at this time in January, 2023, it's worth close to $380 billion. So $380 billion is tangible assets such as shareholders' equity, capital, profits, infrastructure, and facility, and, and, and maybe more. But Tesla's value, maybe 50% value comes from things that you don't see, intangible assets. Intangible assets. What are these intangible assets? Intangible assets are assets such as uh, customer value, customer satisfaction, employee know-how or knowledge, know-how or knowledge, 
the brand called Tesla. Recognition for the brand. Goodwill, etc. So if you see this 380 billion, probably it's only 60 billion here on this side. Rest of the 320 billion is on the other side because Tesla is valued at, I think I was reading about it, said it is valued 20 times more than what is its net worth. The reason it's valued it because uh, the segment that in which it is operating right now, right? So, so business value is some total of tangible and intangible assets. Sometimes we don't pay attention towards intangible assets and those aspects of customer value, customer satisfaction, brand, its recognition, goodwill, and employee knowledge remain equally important and they constitute a major chunk of business value for, for business. From exam standpoint, business value is the sum total of tangible and intangible assets. You will need to know what are tangible assets. You will need to know what are intangible assets to be successful from business value standpoint on the exam. So we talked about examining the business value. We talked about what are these components of business value. Needs assessment. Now this is important. Now let's take a look at a new, let's create a new slide to understand this. All right, so look at this. Initially, we said these six lessons of PMI authorized PMP exam prep, they're nothing but initiating, planning, executing, closing. Keep in mind that monitoring and controlling continues to happen throughout the project. It happens throughout the project. Now, before the project is initiated, look, a project, to start a project, you need, you need resources. You need resources such as financial resources, human resources, knowledge resources, and infrastructure resources. Organization needs to commit to resources before you can start your project. An organization has hundreds of needs, thousands of needs. A big organization has thousands of needs, hundreds of problems, hundreds of opportunities. How do they choose what problem to address and what opportunity to exploit? They can do everything. The work or the body of work is enormous. How do we choose the right projects? How do we choose the right programs and portfolios? How do we make these great investing decisions? Organizations do prioritization. Prioritization. And they rank these business needs. They rank business needs. And they write business cases for some of these business needs. And when the business case is approved, there's much more that happens. Project is initiated. So when is a project initiated? When a business case is approved. And when a business case is approved, project is initiated, is at this time, project charters are created in predictive projects. So, so look, the first step is organizations are doing needs assessment. They are understanding what are the different needs. They are prioritizing these needs. They are writing the business cases, the business document. And this, is, this work right here is called the pre-project phase of the project right here, before the project is initiated. Or in other words, if you have to draw a picture, here we have pre-project work. And then once the business cases are approved, when business cases are approved, 
needs assessment happens here. When business case is approved is when a project is born and initiating or starting of the project happens and you will write a project charter. Then the project will go into planning Then the project will go into executing and then into closing, right? So pre-project starts with needed assessment, understanding the problems and opportunities, ranking them. After ranking, they're sometimes writing business cases, developing benefit management plan, right? So do you still remember what were those two business documents that were created as part of pre-project business case? Benefit document. Prior to biz writing business case, needs assessment takes place. So prior to writing a business case, need assessment takes place, right? Before initiating the project, there is some pre-project work. Let's move to the next slide. We talked about business document. What are these two business document? Business cases. and benefit management plan. We talked about them in detail as part of the whiteboarding that we did. We talked about business cases, we talked about. Now, you know, as part of the needs assessment, let's open a new slide here. So this pre-project phase, where needs document is being created, maybe prioritization is taking place, business cases and benefit management plan are being created. Now, in this pre-project phase, right, needs, need assessment happens first, followed by development of business case. So it's like that. What happens first, even the exam, there's a question, what happens first, needs assessment or business case? There is no confusion here uh, between what came first, chicken or that. Here, needs assessment happens first, followed by development of business case. When a business case is approved, it is at this time, the project goes, project starts, the project is born initiating or sometimes called start of the project happens. And then organization, leadership, sponsoring organization may create a project charter. So to create a project charter, what are some of the documents that you could take a look at? You could take a look at the needs document. You could take a look at the business case. You could take a look at the benefit management plan if they exist, right? There could, there would be for a PM uh, to look at, to understand the need, there would be some shape or form of some kind of business document. So what are the two business documents? Benefit management plan, business case, and we can also add to that the needs document. Needs assessment happens first, followed by uh, the business case development. Approval of business case leads to initiating of the project or the project is born at approval of business case. Keep this in mind and that will help you answer two to four questions on the PMP exam. That's why we spend some time here. PMP exam are based on this idea. Next topic is organizational culture and change management. Topic D. Let's quickly take a look at what have we covered up till now? It's very important to continue to look back and see that uh, and reinforce the knowledge, right? And the best way to reinforce the knowledge is demonstrate it. Let's go see here. So we are in lesson number one, which is called business environment. We covered topic a foundation, a very simple topic. We covered topic 
B, which is strategic alignment covered topic C, which was project benefits and value. Now we are looking at topic D, a very interesting topic about what is what constitute organizational culture and change management. So right here, topic D, we're going to learn about what constitutes learn about what constitutes organizational culture. Actually, what constitutes organizational culture is leadership, which is transformational. Leadership, which is based on taking actions and enabling people to take action. Leadership that is based on inspiration, is providing inspirational leadership. Organizational culture, leadership, forms a very important shared goals, right? Organization culture where everyone understands the goals. There are these shared goals and everyone strives to meet these shared goals are organizations that are more successful, cult, part of culture. Then there are some organization culture, honesty, trust and culture of transparency. Organization culture of urgency in meeting the needs of stakeholders. Organizational culture of uh, shared or empowered teams. You're gonna learn about what constitutes culture, a simple topic, but a very interesting topic. And then change management. Look, change management is a very important component of project management. It's a very important component of project management. And uh, change management's primary uh, the primary and the most important role of change management or, 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 or function of change management is to reduce human resistance towards change. And how can we uh, ensure that the products, the services, the results that we are creating, how can we ensure, ensure that they're embraced, they're loved, uh, they're consumed, they're adopted well over uh, feeding their resistance towards these outcomes, right? That's change management. Very, very important function or component of project management. Change management. Organizations create uh, organizations. They embrace change as a strategy and ensure that all project managers and the teams, we are change makers. You cannot delegate the responsibility of change maker to somebody else. We are change management. If we have a PMO, uh, or you don't have a PMO, you have a change management department or not, but we are the change makers, right? That's our role. And for that, we may have to adopt a robust approach and also customize and tailor the strategy to the needs of the project. Now, change management. Now, look. Right here, so let's open a new slide here. Here, so we start the project. Projects are started, we start the project, sometimes also called initiating. PMI likes to call it start. Initiating, good project managers, they start remembering the future right here. remembering the future. What does that mean? They start in the beginning itself, project managers are doing something called 
organization readiness assessment. At the end, you will see when the project closes, when the project closes, outcome of the project will be delivered. Outcome will be delivered. And we want this outcome to be embraced. Embraced. So what do project managers do in the beginning itself? They do organization readiness assessment to understand in the beginning how ready is our end user community. Based on their readiness, project manager and the team, they start developing artifacts such as artifacts such as FAQs, job aids, manuals, guidelines, tips for success. They start having webinars, town hall meetings, lunch and learn. Why are they doing all this stuff during the course of this project from the beginning to the end? So that when the outcome is delivered, our stakeholders embrace the outcome over resisting it. So change management is a very important component of project management that deals with resistance towards change. How can we overcome this resistance? By doing some level of organizational readiness assessment in the early stages of a project to understand how ready our end user community, our stakeholders are. And to ensure that this project becomes a good news story during this journey from the beginning to the end, we are creating artifacts such as FAQs, job aid, manuals, guidelines, tips for success. Along with that, we are conducting webinars, town hall meetings, lunch and learn meetings, having this continuous communication with our stakeholders about this new product service or result that is being created. So that in the end, it gets embraced. It creates a delightful experience. It creates an exciting experience for our stakeholders. And that's what is change management. If you can remember this, you will get all those two to three questions right on the PMP exam. That's change management right here, right? We talked about change management. Keep in mind, uh, change management is not something that you delegate. Change management, we have to become the change makers. You cannot, whether there's PMO office, there is change management office or not, we and our team must become the change makers and we must do everything possible to ensure that the product, service, and results that we create is embraced over the resistance part, right? So there are some, Prosky actually, Prosky is a governing body. Prosky is a governing body and it has created a a chain management model, right? And they call it ad car, ad car model. And there are five milestones because because change should be brought inside out. And in an organ for an organization to change, for an organization to change, must individuals must change, right? For an organization to change, individuals must change with that. So. Prosky was created, uh, the ad car model, and it's very important for an individual to change. There are five milestones uh, that must be achieved. Awareness of the need for change, desire to support change, knowledge of how change will take place, ability to demonstrate new skills and behavior and reinforcement, rein reinforcement and this could be on the exam. You know, it is just not, you cannot, just training people is not sufficient. Ensuring that they demonstrate these new skills and behavior and continuous reinforcement is important for, for, uh, for a change to stick. An ad car model by Prosky, uh, it's a six months course that is conducted a very elaborate course. I'm Prosky certified, uh, uh, so, uh, but right now our goal is to get PMP certified. So 
uh, ad car model. Now, look at this. You know, change. We say that change. The goal of bringing change is because we want something to be internalized. But to get here for something to be internalized, it always starts with contact. Contact leads to awareness. Awareness leads to positive perception. Perception. Positive perception leads to understanding. Understanding leads to adoption. Adoption leads to institutionalization. Institutionalization. And institutionalization leads to internalization. So it's very easy to say that, well, I want uh, an approach, agile mindset to be developed, but it requires work. It starts with contact, which will lead to awareness. And it's a journey that we take. Change is not, uh, uh, change is not so easy. Right? It's a journey. And there are steps from contact to internalization, right? Uh, and continuous reinform, in, in, for, uh, reinforcement is the key to make the change steps to change stick. What are some of the do's and don'ts uh, to support change? Always coach and mentor. Enable an agile mindset in the organization. Sense of urgency and keep the knowledge as current as possible. And uh, if, you, if you really want to and truly want to support change, don't force it then people will resist it, right? And uh, never alienate the resist re resistors. Rather, have a conversation with people who are resisting the change and, and work with them to bring them in line with the change, right? Uh, get their buy-in by having those conversations. Collaborate with them. Do not, uh, do not separate them. Continue to have... Uh, uh, conversation with them. Do not alienate them. Very, very important. And don't force changes, right? So from exam standpoint, you may find a couple of questions here too. You can plan for change by having some kind of attitudinal, attitudinal surveys and information campaigns. Uh, be open, be transparent about the change uh, and create a change rollout plan. Very, very important. Creating a transition plan is also extremely important. And, uh, you know, change, there should be shared understanding of the change. People should believe in the change. How can we do that? There is this uh, something called North Star Statement. Everyone, everyone knows what the change is, what the need is. And everyone wakes up in the morning looking at the North Star. They all know where they are heading to. A North Star statement has worked very, very well. All great organizations, be it Amazon, be it Apple, be it Tesla, be it Alibaba, uh, be it any other organization that uh, continues to deliver value to the stakeholder, that continues to create delightful and exciting experience for the stakeholders. They all have a North Star statement and people they all have shared understanding of that need or vision, and people are working towards achieving that vision. There's a story from uh, from one of the interviews that uh, that that happened a couple of years ago with Whitney Wolf, who is the founder of Tinder and and uh, Bumblebee. She said uh, one of the things that she did and and the team, the leadership team team did was everyone believed in the vision. And everyone, when they woke up in the morning, they woke up excited because they all knew the North Star and they all believed in where they were heading to, right? It's not just about communication of change. It's about building shared understanding of the change and shared understanding so that people believe in it. And when people start believing in a change, they all start doing the work that is aligned with meeting the vision. The North Star statement is one of the best ways of communicating change and ensuring that there is common understanding or shared belief 
in the vision. And that brings us to, uh, to the end of topic D. Move to topic E, which is project governance. From exam standpoint, there could be two questions from here. And those questions are primarily about a simple definition of governance. Governance or project governance are system and methods put in place to enable decision to enable decision making so that project objectives are met. That's why we put governance in place to enable decision making, to enable decision making. Look, who is going to do the work of the project? The project team. There are certain decisions about the project that project team is bestowed with certain authority. And project teams can make certain decisions. They work in a collaborative fashion and they will make certain decisions. But there will be time when project team will not be able to make the decision. What will, be they, do? What will they do? They all know that at this time there is governance. They can escalate to the PM. Now the PM will work with the team in a collaborative fashion and will try to ensure that we can make a decision. We can come to some kind of a reasonable uh, decision. And the project team can go back to work and start doing the work. Most of the times we are able to get things resolved here. But there will be times when things will be even outside the threshold or tolerance or authority that is given to the, that is delegated to the PM. It will be outside. When things get outside, they will escalate it further to the governance board, sometimes called the project board, sometimes called the steering committee. Some organizations like to call it the senior management team, right? So this is what PMI is testing you on. Project teams have also some authority and they should be empowered to make local project decisions. And I don't really believe in agile or predictive uh, projects, all projects, project teams should be given. In the end, they are experts you have hired to do the work, so they should make some local project decisions. But there will be time when things will be outside the bounds. And project teams should be coached and informed and told about the governance model and what is it, what is it that is within their authority and what could be, what would be escalated. And what is that point of escalation when the project team escalated to the PM? PM would also work with the team and stakeholders and try to enable decision making. Sometimes things will be outside the bounds, authority, and beyond the tolerance or threshold of a PM too. What would happen at that time? PM will escalate it to the governance board because in the end, governance board is not some, some kind of a stick that, well, uh, they're there for some kind of, uh, they're there to, com uh, to ensure compliance and discipline. No, governance board is there to support us in getting the work done in an effective fashion. And when we are stuck and when we cannot make something happen, they can help us, support us in resolving that. And, and in resolving that, right? So if you understand this right here, this idea, this underlying principle and this philosophy, this should be, this topic should be very easy, right? This is what is covered as part of the slides that we discussed now. Project governance. It is the system, the framework, the methods that have been put in place. Put in place to do what? To enable decision making. 
and to ensure that organization's strategic and operation goals are met. We said in our definition before, if you've captured the definition from this whiteboard, you're golden from PMP exam standpoint. Now, governance creates sense of accountability and it creates that point of contact, single point of contact for uh, for of accountability, right? So, but teams should also know at till what level, uh, what is the level of authority bestowed on them? PM should also know their delegated authority and at what time should they uh, should they escalate it to the governance board? Right here, governance could typically be in place when you join your project. It could be established by PM or PMO along with some kind of organizational uh, policies and procedures that are put in place. Governance, so uh, another very important thing about governance is that too much governance can annoy the stakeholders. But relaxed governance is also not good. Relaxed governance can uh, sometimes uh, lead to lack of accountability and lack of engagement among the stakeholders too. So we got to strike the right balance between uh, what is the right governance level of governance, neither too strict, neither too much, nor too relaxed, right? And you can understand that by understanding the nature of industry, the type of project, the level of complexity, the level of uh, level of ambiguity, the level of complexity on your project, and the level of volatility on the project. So. Look, for, for problems that are outside the threshold of project, defined threshold or tolerance of project, what do you do? Escalate. Escalate to the responsible stakeholders. Sometimes that is governance. But if the issue is within the threshold of the PM and the team, resolve it. Don't escalate it. So in the exam, there are questions about, well, there is an issue. Don't escalate it. Resolve it by working collaboratively with your team. Only when you feel that the, uh, the issue or the challenge is outside the threshold, the bounds, or the tolerance level of uh, the PM, the delegated uh, authority of the PM. It is at this time we must we must use governance board. Governance board could be called a project board, a steering committee, or it could also be called um, it could also be called a senior management team meeting. Now. On predictive projects, you will have predictive project governance throughout the life cycle. Throughout the life cycle, the governance would be there. It could be there at the end of the phase, end of phase, sometimes also called kill point sometimes called phase gate review. Phase gate review, sometimes also called stage gate. So in predictive projects, you may have different names. What, what happens during these kind of governance reviews? It could be RV, so we can, we can use a more refined term than PMI, go no go decisions, going to the next phase or not going to the next phase. Go no go decisions are made. Have we delivered the value or not is seen. And are there some changes required to the next phase? Those kind of decisions are made or are we going to shut down or kill the project? Sometimes it's also made at part of this uh, phase gate, kill point, end of phase, uh, phase uh, or stage gate review. Adaptive projects. In adaptive projects, governance can happen at daily. And so let's write down adaptive. In adaptive projects, Governance can happen, adaptive project governance could be at the time of uh, 
So governance could be daily stand-up could be during demos and reviews where we can make a decision about next iteration. And there could be some scheduled meetings also. So next slide speaks about governance in predictive projects. As we said, it is also called, also known as governance gate, kill point, toll gate, or stage gate. What kind of decisions are made during this time? Continue to next phase, do you go, no go decisions? Continue with modification or changes, or should we just prep end the project or program right here? Adaptive project, the work is split into releases and iterations. They review the results at the end of iteration, gather feedback and take actions to improve value in the next iteration. And uh, we uh, later on in the second session, we're gonna talk about minimum viable product. And, and at that time we will discuss uh, what minimum viable product is, right? Whether the definition of done was met or not. Last topic is project compliance, but let's, Go review what we covered in the previous topics. Let's insert a new slide. Here, let's insert a new slide. So we are looking at PMI authorized. PMP exam prep version 3.0 released in 2023. There are six lessons in this guide. Reds of now, we're looking at lesson number one, which is called business environment. There are six topics in this lesson. We looked at topic A, a very simple foundation topic. Topic B, interesting topic around strategic alignment. All projects must be aligned with the vision. Topic C, Project benefits. And value. Topic D. Organizational culture. We talked about organizational culture. Very, very interesting topic. And critical topic from PMI standpoint change management, project change management. Then we looked at topic E, and topic E was governance. Very important from exam standpoint, you could have two to four questions here. And finally, we are looking at compliance, project compliance, project governance and project compliance. So, compliance. Look. This is the life cycle of a project. Start or initiate to close or end. It's the life cycle. Compliance. Compliance requirements start and plan. Be identified as early as possible. Identify compliance requirements. Compliance require as early as possible. Identify compliance requirements as early as possible. And from here till the end, continue to monitor that you are in compliance. Anytime, now this is very important, anytime 
the project manager and the team finds out that we are in some sort of non-compliance, immediate action must be taken to bring the project in line or in compliance. This is the fiduciary responsibility of the project manager. This cannot be delegated, right? Immediately, the moment you find that you are non especially with legal and regulatory uh, uh, co compliance requirement. Keep in mind that compliance requirement should be documented as sometimes risks, right? They could be biggest risks on your project, so much so that remaining non-compliant in some industries can even, your project is non-compliant, that can even lead to threatening the existence of your own organization, right? History uh, provides enough evidence of that. So many organizations because of non-compliance have either have been fined heftily or, or they've even been shut down. So project managers have this responsibility first to identify what compliance requirement based on the nature of industry we operate in. And second, continue to monitor them throughout the life cycle of the project and ensure that we are in compliance. What happens when you are non-compliant? Immediately take actions to become compliant. And if the need be, escalate, right? There are different uh, compliance categories. So there are different compliance categories and these categories could be, uh, cl compliance could be cl classified as regulatory and legal. They could be process, quality, social, ethical and non-corrupt practice, practices, compliance towards work, work, health and safety, and environmental risks. Different categories. It depends on the nature of your industry in which your project is operating. And based on that, you will identify the compliance requirements, right? Usually these compliance requirements exist in the organization. They're available to us. Our job is to identify them for our project for the specific project and ensure that we monitor them, we remain compliant. Any non-compliant issue must be urgently handled. Action should be taken to become compliant or sometimes we cannot, it must be escalated. Remaining non-compliant in a highly regulated industry can lead to hefty fines, number one. Number two, sometimes can even threaten the reputation and existence of your organization look throughout so one of the ways of ensuring that you remain compliant is by performing project audit they are a great technique tool they are a great tool that is available to us and continuously doing audits will tell us whether we are in compliance or not it's something that we should use be prepared to perform quality audits continuously validate legal and regulatory compliance i said identify compliance requirements in the early stages and continue to monitor them to ensure that we are compliant, right? Check compliance before the end of the project to avoid transferring issues. At the end, one more time. In a risk or dedicated compliance reg register, we must include the identified risk, responsible risk owner, the realized risk and risk responses, something all about risk and compliance is something that we are learning as part of lesson number three. One of the topics is completely, fully geared and dedicated to risks and risks even related to compliance. Look, we just had larger organizations or those in highly regulated industries typically have a compliance department or compliance officer. All major organizations nowadays have a compliance requirement, a compliance uh, department why compliance department ensures that we are in compliance with the regulatory or legal requirements or any other compliance based requirements right so finally compliance five best practices and this will bring us to the end of the lesson today the five uh, best practices for compliance documentation, risk planning, establishing a compliance, compliance council, 
conduct compliance audit and make it a formal process and provide compliance to worship. It is the fiduciary responsibility of the project manager cannot be delegated, right? So this brings us to the end of lesson number one. If you heard me well, if you have taken notes from today's uh, conversation uh, and the dialogue, you will find yourself in a really, really good place from lesson number one standpoint. Very soon, we will be uh, we will be providing a similar session on lesson two of PMI authorized PNP exam prep version 3.0 released in 2023. I really hope that you uh, you like the session. I hope that this session uh, gave you insight into the project management practice. Give you insight into lesson number one. Uh, and I always say that if you heard me well, you've taken the right notes, you really don't have to study lesson one. All those 11 to 15 questions that you may see from this lesson have been covered. Uh, I'm hoping you have taken the right notes. And uh, again, on behalf of Education Edge, thank you very much for listening in. Uh, I would request you to share our video, subscribe to our channel, and also uh, uh, like our video if you if you if you g had gained some value from it before we go a quote from one of the quotes that i really like uh, life is like a bicycle if you want to move if you want to keep balance you will have to keep moving forward keep pedaling it's like a bicycle uh, to keep balance you will have to keep moving forward and you have to keep pedaling right there is no substitute for hard work. And on that note, we'll end the session here. Thank you very much for listening. And once again, welcome to Education Edge, uh, your one-stop shop for all certification needs. Mm -hmm.